everybody. Hope you all had a good uh, good lunch and a good break. Enjoyed the enjoyed the sunshine. Um, when we were putting the programme together, we thought, what's the best way of waking everybody up after lunch and we're all sitting there, sort of feeling a bit tired and sleepy? So we we thought a good a good um, presentation on international standards would be just the thing to uh, to get us all going. So. Um, I, I don't really know the best way to introduce the, uh, the, the next speaker. Um, probably the best way for, that I can tell you about Mike Shepherd is um, when I first came into this industry straight out of school as a right behind the ears 16 year old, um, I was told to go and see a guy called Mike Shepherd who was quite a high flying and sort of had a bit of a reputation um, for being quite, sort of not suffering fools too gladly. Uh, Thames Water, and I was sort of quaking in my, uh, in my boots, thinking I'd be lucky to get five minutes. Um, Mike sat down with me for over two hours and went through um, the whole of the water industry, how it works, standards, how the contractors bid, all that kind of thing. And it's something I've never forgotten. Um, and now I actually sit on the same International Standards Committee as Mike, which is something that I feel very, very privileged to, uh, to do. Um, Mike is one of the go-to people in the UK uh, about standards, both UK standards, international standards, and codes of practice. Um, so it's a great pleasure to hand over for half an hour for Mike to, uh, to present on that. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you for that invitation. Thank you for the invitation to come and bore you to death this afternoon. As I said, it's a masterpiece of programming to put me on just when you had a lunch on, on a nice hot day. But anyway, we'll have a go. The title is International Standards and Code of Practice for Pipelining, as I prefer to call it, International Standards for the Rehabilitation of Pipelines, um, something I've been involved with since 1900 and, well, there we go. I've said international, the title originally said UK, there are no UK standards as such. There are some water industry standards for the non-structural and semi-structural lining of water mains and I received this morning equivalent ones for the spray lining of sewers but they do not relate to the mechanical performance of the linings or any installation requirements they only relate to equipment certification and personnel certification so I've eliminated from this presentation because if you thought what you're going to see now is boring that would have been even worse so we'll give you this there are international committees making standards in the subject of renovation and rehabilitation CENTC 165 working group 13 looks at sewers not so much in terms of trenchless rehabilitation they look at all materials it's not just plastics they look at clay concrete and they look at repair be it open cut repair being a, a, just a battery pair. We go with them. They, the Mirror Committee is BS 505.13. Anybody with a dying need to be part of this can join B505.13. I'm sure UKSTT, which is a sponsoring organisation for members of British Standards, would be only too happy to put your names forward. So you're nodding then. So. Same with the gas. It's done by TC. 234 Working Group 6, the Mirror Committee is there, GSE 33. Um, they, again, tend to look at definitions. They've not looked at particular techniques in the way that the last one has, which is ISO TC138 SC8, which is plastics, and that includes CIPP. It also includes polymer concretes for the rehabilitation of sewers, water, and gas, and the pressure sewers and gravity sewers. The Mirror Committee for that is PRA 33, which Matthew sits on. Um, so do I for my troubles. I also sit on TC 138 and some of its working groups. So the scope of the techniques that are covered, I hope you can read that at the back. The top line is rehabilitation of pipeline systems, and that covers all the aspects of rehabilitation that you would have. You've got repair, you've got renovation, you've got replacement, and then it splits down into various topics. So within the scope of TC138 SC8, we have all these techniques, I'll do them a bit closer, from lining with continuous pipes, which is slip lining, right through to other renovation techniques, which you'll notice as a little asterisk on that says they are outside the scope, and they are. But we have 11 renovation techniques 
there, some of which are relevant to gas, some to water, some to sewers. In the terms of trenches replacement, we have we split that into two sections, replacement on the line and replacement off the line. On the line, pipe listing, you'll hear more about that today, and pipe removal, which is not a technique particularly used in the UK yet, but these are international standards, and it's used on the continent in America where you eat the pipe. Uh, when I was with Thames International, working with the international part of Thames, we owned uh, half of Berlin Walk, that's a, looking after the city of Berlin, and they have things, one of the things because of the congested utilities in the city centre of Berlin, if you had wanted to replace a pipe, you had to take it out. And that's where they came up with the technique of pipe eating, where they would actually eat the pipe out of the ground, take it out, crush it, crush it. It is agonisingly slow. I've seen glaciers move faster. But when you've got to do it, you've got to do it. That was the only way they could. The other one we've got for replacement off the line, of course, HDD, and you will hear more about that, I'm sure, today, and impact modelling. Theoretically, we should have pipe jacking with auger boring and microtunneling there. In the first instance, we couldn't get enough international experts together in order to be able to write a standard, or enough countries interested in producing one. You need five, country, five separate countries before you get authority to produce a standard. Also, there are certain standards already existing with for jacking pipes from of polymer concrete or of, of GRP. So the ones that the lines do are not in scope. And of course, open cut replacement, which is the other one. We're not interested in that. Anybody can do that. Dig a hole, put a pipe in, cover it up. Hope nobody notices. So if we look at the structure, we work through what is now six working groups under SCA. We have working group one, which produced what's called the guidance document except it's not called a guidance document because in standards, definitions and nomenclature you're not allowed to use the word guidance. But what that document actually does, and you'll see standards, I've got the standards numbers already for you later on, so hopefully you'll get copies of this so you won't need to write them all down. But what that standard does, it describes every one of the techniques that are in scope and it gives the skip technique, it gives its size ranges, it gives the materials it uses, it gives the lengths you can do, it gives any problems, it gives a bit of information about site footprint, a whole load of things. So if you're looking to pick a technique, you can see what its limitations, what its possibilities are. That document was published at the end of last year in its second edition. So Working Group 1 is now dominant. It's not, sorry, dormant, not dominant. We were dominant, we're now dormant. Because international standards come up for review every five years. So until five years is up and somebody says we want to review that, we modify that standard or amend it, working group one goes to sleep and we all go home. Working group two is about sewers, non-pressure and pressure sewers for renovation. And I'll say the difference between renovation and replacement a bit in an illustration a little later. Working group three is the renovation of water supply networks. I chair that committee. Renovation four, working group four is gas. Renovation, working group five, which Matthew and myself were members of, amongst others, was about the, the trenchless replacement techniques. That, those standards are about to be published, and therefore working group five, like you lot, has gone to sleep. It is now dormant for the next five years. And working group six is a brand new one we invented because we love making this sort of work and that is going to produce standards for the assessment of conformity. In ISO, there are no assessment of conformity standards structure as there is within the SEN things. So if you look at the SEN standard for polyethylene water pipe, uh, which is EN 12201, part seven is an assessment of conformity. And that sets out a QA regime of testing for type testing factor. I won't bore you with the details, I can see the eyes blazing over already. So we'll move on a bit. Look at renovation versus replacement. So I didn't want to pick a pipe example because I'm sure you're going to see enough of those today. So I've picked hair. Now we have a man on before, obviously in need of some renovation, something like yourself, one or two other members here. So after renovation, there we are, the asset is improved. 
in this case, possibly cosmetically, I don't think there was any structural improvement. But you can see that is renovation. We have dealt with an existing asset to improve it in some way, its performance. In this case, not necessarily attracting women, but there we go. We look at replacement, and we now look at the case where, how can we say that? The, the asset, again, we're talking about the hair, has uh, reached its length of service life, I would say. And therefore, something needs to be done, perhaps, necessarily. So then we've gone for replacement. You may have seen the habits of the paper, Wayne Rooney, Michael Horn, what have you. As you can see, this is a trenchless technique. There are no, no trenches there at all. But there are, as anybody who's worked in rehabilitation or renovation, lots of little holes, which is what we put everywhere we go. So there we go. So if we now look at the techniques that are in scope, the structure of making these renovation techniques we sort of inherited from the 1980s. And once you've got a structure for standards, within a, an international standards organisation, it is hell's own job to change. So what we have for each of the topic areas, and the topic areas are non-pressure gas, non-pressure drains and sewers, pressure drains and sewers, water supply, and gas supply. For each one of those application areas, we have these renovation technique, this structure. So the four application areas each have a part one, which is general, and that details the requirements, performance requirements, which are applicable to every one of the parts that's in scope. And then we have each one, part two, which is lining with continuous pipes, part three, closed fit, all the way through to lining with inverted, inverted hoses at part 11. So for, you always need a part one, and then you might need the part two, three, four, five, whatever, to go with it. And that's for each application area, which is a mess. You can end up having to buy 30 standards if you want to do it all. Which standards authorities love, because they charge by the page. Ultimately, what we want to do on the next revision of these standards is to have one part two for all application areas, and one part three for all application areas. But that will take time to work towards, and we will try and do it. We look at the structure of the standards, we're all in a common format, so the clause structure is all the same. And because we're looking at renovation, we differentiate between the as manufactured state and the as installed state. Because the installation, strains, scrapes, or whatever can change the finished product. And what we're interested in as end users, my representation on all these committees is as an end user, is what we've actually got at last. That's what we pay for. We don't pay for a bit of pipe, we don't pay for winches. We pay for pipe in the ground, commission and working. So we distinct between those. We include installation methods and equipment. We include commissioning requirements. And we require a submission of an installation manual. It gives the installation parameters. It gives the loads. It gives any special fittings you might need if you want to connect to it in the future. And that is all in, in, in with each standard. So if you look at the structure, there's the structure of each one of the renovation standards. Um, Matthew will be familiar with this, I think it came up a bit of a shock. If there is nothing to write for a particular item, you write, there are no, you have a clause on it, it's title, and then you write, there are no requirements. Well, that's the way you do it. One of the interesting things is clause eight, fitness for purpose of an installed lining system, the I stage. The M stage is as manufactured, and the I stage is as installed. By and large, especially with the polyethylene standards for close fit and slip lining, we're all talking about standard polyethylene pipe. We assume that the pipe will be made to the relevant pipe standard, ISO 4427 for water or Kyoto R1 if it's a European standard. But we look at fitness for purpose. Now, if you've done a close line fitting, close line fitting lining, you don't want to cut a bit out of it to prove that it's all right kind of defeats the object. So we have a system whereby we allow, for time testing, we allow simulated installations. And we have a matrix 
that allows for a, you can either do a simulated installation process. Is that the right one? Yeah, just for that. So the, the product is installed, and then you take the sample from that simulated installation, and you get your data. You could actually maybe do it from an actual installation. That tends to be rare. We recognise that if you've got a liner that you've put in a pipe as a tank fit, you don't want to cut a bit out the middle because then you have to revamp it. Good business for the uh, suppliers, I suppose. There we go. The other thing, and John talked about this a little bit today, we have rather more detail and we have more specific definitions between this independent and interactive pipe. And these are the actual definitions. An independent liner is capable of, on its own of resisting without failure all applicable internal loads. Interactive linings are linings which rely on the existing pipeline for some measure of radio support. And John gave exam good examples of when an SDR 11 pipe could be independent or could be interactive. And then he confused things slightly with his definitions of structural and semi-structural. And again, these are the definitions that we use, and these are the ones that are codified and we include in any standard. So we have your independent liners here, loose fit or plug fit, which are independent and fully structural. These are the techniques within scope which comply with that. For class B and class C, which again I mentioned we have for interactive linings, which are also deemed semi-structural, but we have two classifications. We have one lining which relies on ring stiffness and another type of lining which relies on adhesion, relies on sticking, if you like. So close fit pipes are always going to be ring stiffness, Adhesive backed hoses, which is a technique used in the Far East extensively, is always going to be interactive because they rely, as it says, adhesive backed. They rely on adhesion to stick to the inside of the hose pipe. And lining with sprayed polymeric materials is semi structural for the purposes of this standard. We only look at the ones which have certain structural capability, of which 3M was a prominent manufacturer who stopped manufacturing their product in February this year. But we didn't know that. And then we have the non-structural, which are the traditional spray linings for anti-corrosion that John referred to. They are outside the scope of our standard. So that's a bit of an amplification of the, uh, the points that John made. If we look at the documents, those standalone for replacement standards. But again, 11295, which is the overall guidance document to all the techniques, all the replacement ones are listed in there. And we've produced two standards, one for pipe bursting and pipe extraction, and one for replacement off the line by HDD or impact molding. They're the numbers, they're EN ISOs. I won't bore you, but these are standards which are like, uh, which are the relevant standards in the EU as well as worldwide. They're produced under a thing called the Vienna Agreement, and I will happily bore somebody for three quarters of an hour afterwards if you need to know more about the Vienna Agreement. If I've had to suffer learning about it, I don't see why I should suffer alone. Those standards are finalised. These were the Working Group 5 standards I mentioned earlier, and they are published by ISO, will be published imminently soon the table about the status of these things later. They follow, again, a common structure, and that's the clause structure for it, with all the bits and pieces. At the moment, for this standard, we, when we produce these standards, we, we produce what's called state of the art, what's common usage. So at the moment, we only are using polyethylene within these replacement standards. But we have a big argument about whether we should use PVC, <coughs> because there are some PVC techniques around. Those, some may be familiar with this very strange concept of weldable PVCU. Anybody been challenged with that one yet? It's around, used in Australia and America. Nobody will tell me what the welding parameters are. It's a secret. You know, Keith's familiar with the weldable PVC. Any opinion? We, we, we have welded it, but it's a very difficult pipe to weld. Yeah. 
So it's not state of the art as far as we're concerned, so it's not included. But it might be in the next one. Can they get it round to doing it? Oh well. So the publications. All the standards are set up will be published as in the UK, BN, EN ISOs. An EN standard doesn't become official until it is published by your national standards body. So in the UK that will be published as a BS EN ISO. In Germany it will be a DIN EN ISO. In Holland, it will be an ND and ISO. In France, it will be an AFNORI and ISO. Um, they all come under the Public Procurement Directive, which means if you specify a renovation and you want to specify a standard, you must use these standards as a public utility in the UK. Unless, like the gas industry, you plead health and safety and ignore it and use something else which is challengeable in a tender if you don't do it. It may come a shock that, that some of these standards have been existing for over five years and when they were in the second edition and nobody knew which is why about the actually existing, which is why I was glad of the chance to come along and spread this little gospel today and I'm looking for converts to sign up afterwards. The way it happens is the documents are first published by ISO because they have a different system in the, in the rest of the world. They ISO will publish and then they go to national ones. SEN ratifies standards by publishing their, their existence within the European Journal and then they're published by the national standards bodies. So, am I going to decide? Not that. State of play. This is the meat. This is the bit you all wanted to know. What exists? These are the numbers 11296. 297 for sewer pressure, 298 for water, 299 for gas. And these are the part numbers, all 11. Where there is a dash, it means there's no standard envisaged. You will get copies of this, hopefully. Where there's a question mark means we could have a standard, but does anybody want one? until five countries are said to say they want one and will supply experts to aid in drafting them, what will happen? Adhesive back hoses is maybe for special sewers, not for gas or water, uh, sorry, in, in for gas and water, they are intended for production. Um, w means we're actually working on Rigidly anchored plastics is a technique used on the continent, notably Germany for predominantly uh, rigidly anchored plastic, which we always refer to as raffle, rigidly anchored flexible layer. And basically, it's a polyethylene skin like Velcro, you make it into a tube with little hooks sticking out, and you push that in with a former on the inside and pump a lot of out on the outside. So it's, it's a combination of Aligned cement mortar line pipe, but known by the very attractive technical term as raffle. And we have the sprayed polymerics I referred to earlier. So here's the state of play. General, the part ones of all the documents are now in their second edition. They've all existed for at least five years, at least in fact more than that, because as Matthew will attest, we're very fast at producing standards, but even we take two years to get one through. Yep. Was it two years? No. Yeah, normally it's about three. Yeah, the, any start of grey hair that Matthew's got is due to working on working group five. I've got a lot more. So, the second edition, the ISO published, ISO's published it, BSI haven't got round to it yet, except on Friday last week, 298 part one was published with the BS. If you're on the committee, by the way, if you're on the mirror committee, which covers these standards, you get your copies free. You don't have to buy them when BS publishes them. The fact you don't write them means you get a free, you have a free draft in word format anyway, but there we go. Uh, continuous pipes, non-pressure sewers in its second edition, the others, the water one, has now been published as a BSEN ISO publication. This stage is the, the, 
the final stage for technical comment. Once all the, the technical comments are sent in after a disc vote, the committee, the working group gets together, says, do we accept this, do we not accept this? You have to give a reason if you don't accept it. And then it goes, standards change, go to what's called FDIS, final draft international standard stage, circulated to the member the mirror committees of the relevant countries, but at that stage they can only make editorial comments, no more technical comments. So if you ever asked to comment on a DIS, do it, because it's your last chance to make your technical points. The working group may look at them, laugh and tear them up, but you know, what do you say? As I say, there's one there at FDIS stage. Again, lining with close fit pipes is in its second edition for all four application areas. So if you've written anything for a slip lining contract or something somewhere and put a specification in, and you wrote your own company specification in there, you were all breaking the law. And could have been challenged. And in the UK, if you do get a challenge on, on contravening the public procurement directive, they don't prosecute your company. What they do is they prosecute Her Majesty's Treasury. And they can't prosecute you afterwards. <laughs> so it's only, it's only agony delayed, really, plus the fact you've upset the government in the process. Uh, we've got one or two, as I say, the ones discrete pipes, no interest, adhesive backed hoses are being worked on for water and gas. British gas might not like it, or network gas, or northern gas networks as it is now. <coughs> But they are used in other countries as well. Because remember, these are ISO standards. These are worldwide standards. So if things are used elsewhere in the world, we're obliged to cover them. And that's where we are at the moment. Inserted houses, John put up a, I can't you put up the thermopipe system and another one, whose name I can't remember, but they come under the inserted houses category. So Placement standards are saying they are awaiting ISO publication. ISO published twice a month. They publish on the 15th of the month and 30th of the month. And we're expecting that that will have been done. Have been done already? Two minutes, you said. Okay. Oh, you're holding it the right way around. Yeah, fine. The other standards work, let's say, Working Group 6 is producing on the assessment of conformity. For those standards, we've split it by material. Certainly PE, GRP, there's some debate as whether we include a, a, a testament of conformity standard or PVC. And there is a mirror committee working on the structural design, the actual structural design. John talks about BSCN 1295, which is the structural design for, just for buried pipelines. So working group TC165, working group 12 are working on an actual design standard for lined and structural lining pipes. And that, we, I'll put time scale, we don't know because some research work, what they call pre normative research, is necessary to get the constraints right. Because the behaviour of uh, polyethylene being a viscoelastic material is very different from the way, as a lining, it acts very different in the way it's constrained within a pipe to just bury it in the ground. So, they're looking at that. So, if I pick my schedule, thank you very much. I'm sure there are no questions. <laughs> Again, questions for the mic. Stunned silence. <laughs> Sorry? The last time, you mean the one for, for um, Structural design of linings. Yeah. No. I can't even do that because one of the fingers in the air means they've got to first of all get the money to do the pre-normative research. And when you're trying to get money out of the EU, especially under the current Brexit and all the other confusion, is on the note of Brexit, just to finish you off completely. SENS, the organisation that produces European standards, is not part of the EU. It is a separate organisation with a big membership of which BSI is a member. So Brexit is not going to affect SEN 
BSI will continue to be a member of STEM and will continue to work in on European standards, EN standards, which is logical because people do global sourcing now. So we went back to the old BS, all the manufacturers would have to do extra testing and test everything twice. Not that I have Another nail in the coffin there. Thank you very much. Going from Berkshire now to Brussels. So uh, 